So, Tim, you're in New York? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're we're you know just in in the city. I mean, we can we can only go to contiguous states, or else we have to quarantine coming back. So we're actually we're going to go to upstate for a few days for you know into the mountains for a rest. But we're kind of stuck here. I guess so. The teaching is online right yep all the teaching is by zoom which I, it doesn't bother me i mean it bothers some people but you know i guess my normal style is to kind of ignore the students anyway so you know, <laughs> put me in front of a whiteboard and i'll just go right doesn't really matter <laughs> okay i guess while we wait for last minute i'm going to say a few words so first, thank you, everyone. Uh, that's amazing to have you all around. And um, so I'm going to say first uh, that next week, uh, Paul Tappenden, who's there somewhere, I don't see you. Paul, yes, see you now. Uh, he's going to give a talk on indefinite state on Everett, uh, Everett here. So we're going to finally say something about many words. Um, I guess today we're going to say something about many words too. That's my, that's my feeling. Um, there's going to be a couple of people commenting uh, still to confirm and then the week next or in a couple of weeks still uh, have to settle that also Lev will, go and, will give a talk no. so that's it for the next meeting uh, of course I'll keep you posted and uh, besides uh, for today um, Tim was uh, very kind to accept to give a, an introductory presentation to, to sort of kick off the discussion. Uh, I gathered a few questions from you, uh, which are sort of points uh, to, for, for the discussion. Uh, so I guess after, after team presentation, we're going to start from there. Unless you have uh, questions directly on the presentation, of course. Uh, I think that's it. Uh, I'm going to record the meeting as usual. So. Uh, it's going to be available soon. And okay, we go. So Tim Modrin is a professor of uh, philosophy at New York University. He's also author of various important uh, books in philosophy of physics, uh, Quantum Non-Locality and Relativity, and uh, Philosophy of Physics 1 and 2. One in, is in uh, space-time, and the other one is uh, Quantum Theory, recent, uh, from last year, I think and mm -hmm. also founder or co-founder of the John Bell Institute for Foundations of Physics. I think you have the shirt now, right? That's, yes, I have my, my John Bell shirt on, one of them. And so you can check also information about the John Bell Institute. Uh, I think you should, there's always uh, events and news uh, that are interesting. So yes, thank you, Tim, whenever you want. Okay, so I thought, I, I mean, this is supposed to be an open discussion, but I thought I'd just take uh five or ten minutes to set some things up one thing is that i wanted to do just really quickly because uh uh i mentioned when i do non-locality i mean what jean did was absolutely correct and accurate and so on when i do it i tend to use this ghz thing and not everybody's familiar with it, it so i just thought i'd first go over the ghz argument because it's nice and clear then talk a little bit about local vehicles, and then, and then we can just have the discussion. Um, so for anybody you know, unaware of it, it, long after Bell's original argument, there was this um, setup that was discovered by Greenberger, Horn, and Zeilinger, all to do with spin. And it has the, the nice advantage of putting together the EPR argument and its use of perfect correlations, particularly its use of perfect correlations together with the Bell argument. And so you get a, a, a Bell non-locality result that does not depend upon taking statistics over a long series of runs and then comparing comparing these statistical predictions. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, Merman, uh, David Merman, when he, you know, essentially, I, I, someone asked me for this paper and I went back and looked at the end of it. 
right before Greenberger, Horn, and Zioner came up with this thing, Merman had actually written that he had the suspicion, it wasn't an argument or anything, the suspicion that it was essential to Bell's result that you have these non-trivial probabilities, right? These non-zero one probabilities. And then this argument comes out and it's all zeros and ones, okay? And, and then he just retracted. I mean, he was very good. He said, well, I was wrong, you know? Um, and, and I think it does lay out the thing so clearly that, that it's hard not to get the point. So the deal is that instead of an entangled pair of particles, we're looking at an entangled triple. We're gonna be looking at entangled triple of spin half particles. Um, and so this, this gadget in the middle is a kind of uh, symbolization of a device that you, you stick a button on it and it, you push a button and it spits out uh, three particles in these three different directions that can then separate to arbitrary distance, which is of course the thing that's going to make problems for locality. And now we're going to have three experimenters, Alice, Bob, and Charlie in their labs, and you can imagine them being as far apart from each other as you like. Uh, and they're going to do spin measurements, and the other nice thing is they each have a choice of two ways they can orient their stern Garrock apparatus. Uh, they can either, as it were, orient it in the x direction or the z direction, right? So they can do what we laughingly call measure the x spin or the z spin of their particles. Uh, and just to be clear, this choice of these two orientations can be made however you like. Um, th there's been, maybe people know, a whole bunch of confusion about having to invoke free will or you know free choices of experimenters as if actual physics experimenters sit there with their stern garrock apparatus going, yeah, this, I'll do this, no, I'll do this, right, you know. No, that, you know, that's not the point. The point is you can hook this up to anything you want. Um, and in particular, you can hook it up to any kind of thing that you regard as a randomizer. So, uh, you know, you could hook it up to a lottery, you know, a thing that's pulling balls out of a lottery thing, or you could hook it up so that the, the choice is made on the number of shares in some stock that have just been sold on the stock market, or you could hook it up to a pseudo random number generator that's reading off the parity of digits of pi, starting with the 898,000th digit. Any of these, any physicist or any scientist would regard as a good way to randomize that setting between the two, okay? And the point of saying you can do that however you want is that if, if <laughs> and, and, and physicists in this case become actually, I can now say Trumpian in their conspiracy theories and say, no, 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 it's all rigged behind the scenes, right? Um, these choices aren't, aren't, are really being made in some coordinated way. No, make them however you like, right? And if, if at the end of the day, you have to say they're being magically coordinated in some way you know not what, you know, just just hang it up, just move on, right? You're not doing empirical science anymore. Okay. Um, okay, so each of them can decide to either measure the X spin or the Z spin, and they do it independently of each other and however they like, they, you know. And so on each run, you're gonna get one of eight possible uh, global configurations of this experiment. And of those, uh, eight possible global configurations, we really only care about four. The, the, the theory will make predictions for all eight, of course, but they're, they're, you know, half the time, if this is being done randomly, half the time you'll get one of these four. And so just, you know, in obvious notation, the four we care, uh, sorry, I was using Z. The four we care about are, either when all three of them happen to measure X or when two of them measure Z and, uh, and the other one measures X, okay? Uh, and so, you know, this is, this is Alice's choice, Bob's choice, Charlie's choice. 
So run the thing, take the data, then you, you, what you have are strict, in, strict predictions for each of these four cases. Now they're strict not in predicting exactly whether you'll get up or down for each of the three, but they are strict in saying that in this orientation, and now, you know, I, I may get this backwards from what I've written, but it's gonna be the same. In this orientation, you're gonna get uh, an, even, an even number of up outcomes, right? So it could be zero, it could be two, but it's not gonna be one or three, never, right? And that's again, this is like in the EPR argument, they talk about these perfect correlations between the position outcomes and perfect correlations between the momentum outcomes. And when you translate that the way Bohm did into spin, there are perfect correlations between spin outcomes when you measure in the same direction in a singlet state. So if you, if you happen to measure all the X's, you get an even number of ups, but if you do any of these, you get an odd number, right? And again, this could be, it could be either one or it could be three. And there, there are probabilities for how often it will be each of these, but we don't care about those. All we care about is, our, is this pair of predictions. If you measure all the X's, you'll get an even number. And if you measure all the, uh, if you measure two Z's and an X, you'll get an odd number of up outcomes. Okay, so let me just pause here. Everybody see the setup? Good, okay. So, and, and, and it, to me, it always helps, and it's gonna help when we get to the stuff about local beables to really think in a very concrete physical way. You know, you're just grabbing these, grabbing these magnets and either doing this to them or this to them, and then recording where these flashes occur. Now, everything I'm gonna say, and this will probably be useful later, does assume that there are unique results, right? So it's, I'm, I'm expressing all of this in a single world vocabulary, which is merely the assumption that every time you run this, Alice makes one of the two choices, Bob makes one of the two choices, Charlie makes one of the two choices, and each one records, gets a particular outcome, either up or down, and records it. And, you know, records it on a piece of paper, and it's there, right? They can later, at their convenience, go and trade their papers around or Xerox them or send the information, all that can happen afterwards. But, but the, the assumption is that in each lab, one experiment is run and in each lab, one outcome occurs. And that these experiments are run and the outcomes occur at space-like separation. So if we get to many worlds where you say, no, 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 really in each lab, in some sense, both, you know, both experiments were done and all four possible outcomes occurred or something like that. All right, then, then you have, uh, <laughs> then you have a job to even explain what these predictions are, because they're obviously predictions about the joint outcomes and things like that. And we can get into that, right? But, but, but that's not the way I'm going to present it, because that seems to me to be a pretty desperate move. Okay, so, so what's the deal? Well, first of all, because these predictions are made with certainty, it's clear that knowing the outcomes of any two of these will allow you to predict with certainty the outcome of the third, right? So, you know, if, if they happen to all measure X, and you know that Bob got up and Charlie got down, then since it has to be an even number of ups, Alice had to get up, right? So that's, not, that's again, a, a replication of the EPR observation. And that's actually where the so-called EPR criterion of reality comes in, where the criterion is, if you can predict the outcome of an experiment with certainty without in any way 
influencing or affecting that experiment, okay, then there must be some element of reality that's determining the outcome of that experiment, right? If you know what's going to happen and you're not doing anything that has any influence on it, then it has to be predetermined physically what's going to happen. That's, that's the whole EPR argument. And together with the tacit assumption, which Einstein thought was so obvious that he didn't make a big deal of it, that this kind of extreme uh, spatial separation or doing the experiments, you know, in the extreme case at, at space-like separation would mean that nothing Bob does or nothing that happens here could have an influence or affect anything that Alice does or what happens here or anything Charlie does and what happens here, right? So then you say, how do I apply that? I say, okay, well, look, uh, Charlie gets his answer, Bob gets his answer from those and without them doing anything else, they can now predict what Alice's outcome will be. So there must be something in the world that determined Alice's outcome. There has to be an element of physical reality that corresponds to the outcome that she got. Because, you know, how else, if, if, if nothing was determining it, then it could have come out either way, right? You could say, oh, it's fundamentally chancy, it's fundamentally indeterministic, but given Bob's and Charlie's outcomes, the, the, the chances are ones and zeros, right? There's only one outcome that's allowable here, and there's only one outcome that ever happens here. So in a local theory, you have to have that the physical state of this triple of particles when it comes out of here predetermines what the outcome of either, either of these experiments would be, because either one could be chosen. Again, you can randomize this choice however you like. So as it, you know, as it were, each particle has to be prepared with a set answer to, to this question. And this is going back again, if you happen to look back at, at Schrodinger's cat paper, he talks about these pupils in his classroom who are all prepared to give the right answer to whatever question he asks, right? And you can just check that. You have a whole bunch of questions. And whenever you ask a question, they give the right answer. And you say, well, gee, it must be they all know all the answers because I'm just picking at random, right? Um, I'm picking which student and which question, however I like. And I, they always, every single student always gives me the right answer. They must all know all the answers. Um, it would be crazy to think that, no, 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 each student, for example, only knows the answer to one question, and it's always the question you happen to ask them, right? Even though you're flipping coins or doing whatever, however you decide which student to ask and what to ask, it always happens to be exactly the right student and, and, and ask exactly the right question. Good. So in a local theory, now the other, you know, look, the other possibility is if, if Charlie and Bob and Alice or their equipment can communicate with each other, right, if, if they're actually in some kind of causal contact, then the actual outcomes here could influence the outcome here. And then you could set things up this way without predetermining it. But the outcome here would then have to be dependent on getting information about what happened here and what happened here. And in particular, getting information actually about how these were set. All right. So Einstein, of course, never even imagines that you'd give up on locality or, or, or endorse this spooky action at a distance in that way. So he would say, you know, it must be that these are predetermined. Now, what's the problem? The problem now is a simple piece of mathematics, which is that you can't do it. OK, um, it's just not possible. Why not? Well, this is the argument that Berman gave, and it's, it's really, you know, it's one of these things that you see it and you go, okay, uh, this is so clear that I can't deny it, right? <laughs> um, this argument is so beautiful that, that it's not as if there's some hidden premise or some weird thing going on. So what's the idea? The idea is Alice can decide to either measure x 
or, or Y. Bob can uh, X or Z. Bob can measure X or Z. Charlie can measure X or Z. So let's just put these in, in an obvious way. Let's say that Alice, uh, let's do it this way, XA, XB, XC. So these circles represent the experimental situation where A, B, and C measure X. Um, then let's see, that's A, B, so this must be Z, C, this must be Z, B, and that must be Z, A. Right. Um, so there are, are six discrete experimental conditions, depending on the person and what they're measuring. And then the nice thing to notice is that these four possibilities of the eight, the four that we care about, are correspond to these four lines that are drawn on the diagram, right? So I can just, I'll just draw this one in, in red, right? So that's Alice measuring X, Bob measuring X, Charlie measuring X, and then the other three lines, which I'll just put in blue, are the other three possibilities with two Zs and one X. And remember, if you do this, you have to get an odd number. I guess I usually do this the other way. It's OK. If you do this, you get an odd number of ups always. And if you do the red, you get an even number of ups always, uh, whether it's 0 or 2. So now the question is really simple. In a local theory, you have to predetermine these outcomes, which means you have to write U or D in each of these circles. And the, the simple mathematical question is, can you write U and D in these circles so that these four constraints will all be simultaneously satisfied? Okay. Well, I don't know. Let's give it a shot. I mean, let me just try it once and then I'll give you the general argument. So, we need to put U and Ds in these three in the X circle so that we have an even number. Let's make it easy. Let's make it zero. So these would all be down outcomes. So I'll write D, B, D. Now I have to make a choice here. Ah, let me just try a U, see what happens. So along this row, I need to have an odd number. I've got a D and a U, so this has to be another D. And now I'm screwed, right? Because I need an odd number this way, which means I have to put a U here. And I need an odd number this way, which means I can't put a U here. And so I can't do it, right? So I failed. Now you might say, oh, well, you just you know, try something else. And then Merman gave this sort of lovely argument. And he said, look, here's how you know it can't be done. By reductio, suppose you thought it could be done, that you could put U's and D's in, this, in these circles in some way that satisfy the four constraints. OK, pick up these three tokens, throw them in a hat. Pick up these three. You'll make, take another copy of that one. Pick up these three, throw them in a hat. Pick up these three, throw them in a hat. Pick up these three, throw them in a hat. So now I've put 12 coins in the hat. And I had to pick up an even number of views along here. So that was even, odd, 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 so three odd. So I now have an odd number of views in the hat. But I picked up every coin twice, because every coin sits at the intersection of two of these lines. So no matter how I put the U's and D's down, you can't do it. It just, you know, it, so this is just, that's the whole mathematics of the thing, right? The entire mathematical content is, yeah, I can't write U and D in these circles. I'm having trouble hearing you. Oh, sorry. Can't write U and D in these circles in a way to satisfy those four constraints. No local theory can predict that no matter how Alice, Bob, and Charlie set their devices, these constraints will be satisfied. So no local theory can make, and this is a prediction of quantum mechanics, no local theory can make the predictions of quantum mechanics. And furthermore, you check in the lab. And in fact, this is what happens. So who cares about quantum mechanics, right? You, have, you can actually make three labs that work like this. And no local theory can give you this behavior. 
So no local theory can recover the actual way the universe works, okay? So again, this is just another way of proving it. It, it, it seems to me it, it, it just clears out some of the cobwebs. And if you're not convinced by what I just said, you know, you can write this down on a cocktail napkin and, and sit there and, and, you know, just study it at the bar at your leisure and completely convince yourself of the impossibility of predetermining these outcomes, okay? Now, where does that leave us? Well, again, it, all of this in the setting of a, of, a, of a single world theory where, in fact, exactly one experiment was done, and in fact, it had exactly one outcome, which you can later find out about, but that's really neither here nor there, and, that the, and the three experiments can be done at space-like separation, then you just need some kind of uh, causal influence or physical influence of the choices made by two of the experimenters on the outcome that the third experimenter gets. Because you can't do it without it. And so you're stuck with non-locality. Now the, the question from a physical point of view is, okay, how do I implement that? And then we could talk about, of course, any, since this is a prediction of standard quantum mechanics, any theory that recovers standard quantum mechanics, at least in a single world setting, there will be a way this happens, right? There'll be an explanation or there'll be a, you know, an account of what's going on. And not surprisingly, that account will appeal to the wave function, which is itself not really a local object. And it'll appeal to, particularly, it'll appeal to entanglement between the spin degrees of freedom of these three particles in the wave function, because the, the, the state that gives rise to these predictions is obviously an entangled state between the three particles. So, and, and again, you know, what, what Schrodinger said in the cat paper, which is just an incredibly brilliant thing to have said, is that he, he introduced the term entanglement and he said it's entanglement, not anything else, not indeterminism, for example, not any constraints on our knowledge. Right? It's entanglement that forces you to depart from classical lines of thinking when dealing with quantum mechanics. And it's the entanglement here that gives rise to this behavior. Okay, so what else do we need to, to have this discussion? Well, the main thing that was allowing us to assume that what happens, right, the choice that Alice makes and the outcome she gets cannot have any direct influence on Bob or Charlie was that they are spatially separated as far as like uh, a far uh, as far apart as you like we can even do the experiments at space like separation that language and now it's I'll, I'll just reference the things I asked you to look at if you if you wanted which was Bell's paper on the theory of local beables and then and then what he does in uh, against measurement that language involves talking about space-time, talking about things happening in space-time. Um, it doesn't actually, that the language I just gave doesn't mention the wave function or entanglement or anything. It just says, Alice did such and such an experiment. Bob did such and such an experiment. Charlie did such and such an experiment. These are the re three results they got. And they did these experiments in labs that were really far apart, and they did them at at, uh, at space-like separation. In order for that to make sense, you have to have a physical picture with space-time uh, and preferably a relativistic space-time with a light cone structure so you can talk about space-like separation. And you have to be able to talk about stuff happening in particular regions of space-time. You have to be able to talk about Alice setting her device in her lab and a spot appearing in her lab that's either you know, up or down, and the same for Charlie, and the same for Bob. And so this was, this was Bell's point in his paper on the theory of local beables, which was to say, all our talk about experiments, and in fact, all our talk about empirical data, 
comes down in the end to talk about stuff happening in space and time, right? We may postulate stuff that isn't straightforwardly locatable in space and time, like a wave function. A wave function is not straightforwardly locatable in space and time. Um, it's not, as Bell said, a local beable. Uh, I mean, Bell used to say, look, you can't point here and say, what's the value of the wave function, its phase or its magnitude, right? Suppose you have, if you have, an, if you have a 12 particle system, you have to pick out 12 points in space time. And then you can ask for the phase or magnitude of the wave function relative to that set of 12 points. But a local beable is something that physically is just there and it's there in some delimited region of space or space time. And Bell's point is that if, you, if your theory doesn't have any of those, if it has none, then we really don't know, at least from the beginning, how to make sense of it in terms of making predictions that we can check in the lab. Because all the language we use to describe laboratory operations and their outcomes is language about the local behavior of local things, right? Their, their geometrical shapes, how strong the currents are that are running through them, how big the magnets are, whether the spots occur here or here. This is all the language of, of actually macroscopic things because the outcomes and the settings have to be macroscopic or we wouldn't be able to see them or make them. Um, the, the experimental data is described in the language of macroscopic objects in space and time. And if your theory doesn't have any such things, then quite honestly, there's no, how do you apply it, right? How, why would you say your theory has any consequences you can test in a lab? And so this was what Bell was insisting on in the theory of local beables. And the, the reason why I wanted you just to look at the end of against measurement is that this is Bell's understanding, which I think is a nice thing to say, of one of Bohr's points, and one he agrees with, is when Bohr says that the experiment must be described in classical language. Now, by classical language, Bohr did not mean classical mechanics. Because if the experiment could always be described in terms of classical mechanics, then all the predictions would come out of classical mechanics, right? So by classical language, that's not what he meant. What he meant was what Bell meant. Macroscopic objects, right? The dispositions of macroscopic objects. And so Bell liked that. He said, yeah, that's right. In order to connect the theory to experience or the theory to data, we need a connection to a language of objects in space and time. And the way you should do that is by having stuff in space and time. Now, I mean, Bell doesn't argue that there's absolutely no other way to do it. And God knows people have gestured at the idea that you could have a theory that at least foundationally has no space and time in it, at least no familiar space and time, right? No three-dimensional, you know, macroscopically three-dimensional space and stuff in it. Um, and, and so you get, you know, some bumper sticker slogans like Sean Carroll sometimes says, we live in Hilbert space. And well, Hilbert space is some infinite dimensional space. And so you'd say, well, wait a minute, if I live in Hilbert space, what am I doing with my hands right now? Right? I mean, <laughs> you know, they seem to be moving around in three dimensions. And then and then you sometimes get this very hand wavy, ironically, hand wavy stuff about, oh, it's all functional somehow, some functional analysis is all drop out, blah, blah, blah. But that's never, to my knowledge, actually ever done in, a, in anything like a clear and acceptable way. It's just some kind of programmatic thing. Um, the way you don't need that is, of course, to have a theory that just has a space time that is at least macroscopically four-dimensional. Maybe it's more dimensional microscopically, right? Maybe there are, there are you know, eight rolled up little compactified dimensions at microscopic scale. Fine. I don't know. You know, that could be. But macroscopically, four-dimensional space-time, 
and some local beables, some physical local stuff in that space time, out of which Stern Gerlach magnets are made, okay? Out of which screens are made, out of which dots are made that appear on screens. If the theory has that, then you know how to connect the theory's predictions to experiment, because then you just read off from the disposition of the local beables, according to the theory, what happened in the lab. Um, and then you know what you're doing. And can I interrupt you know, the, in the middle? Or in, or hmm? should I, can I ask a question? Let, let yeah, me. sure. I, I mean, I'm really done. I mean, that's actually, so let me, that was really the point why I wanted you to read, because that Bell paper on the theory of local beables is not one people read a lot, but I think it's as important in a way as his theorem is, is this, you know, is to get at this account of space time. Okay, so yeah, let me stop there and then open it up because I didn't mean to take so much time. Thank you, I think, guess Lev, you're first. Okay. Um, Sorry, may I, uh, meantime, if someone has questions, uh, if they cannot uh, write them, if their name on the chat so that I can have the list in order. Thank you. Sorry, Lev, you can go. So I, I want that you will first maybe clarify the need for these beables and maybe try to explain a little more what they are. Because if I am with quantum mechanics, textbook quantum mechanics, or GRW quantum mechanics, which is, I think, very, very similar, it's just textbook quantum mechanics with some specific uh, mechanism. When I uh, say that every time uh, there are situations like uh, quantum measurements or anything of the kind, then there is a collapse and all this, your, your screen, your devices, your stern magnets, they always are well localized in three dimension. They collapse. So they all, all macroscopic objects in uh, the standard quantum mechanics uh, live in three dimensions. The wave function of all macroscopic objects are in three dimension. So why do you need anything else? We already have this. I, 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 this is not anything special. It's not anything additional. This is just wave function. This is okay. not the Hilbert space. The wave function of all macroscopic objects live in three dimensions. So why, why, is this, is it, uh, why is this is not a uh, beable or what do you want as a beable? No, 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 it's the other way around. Yeah. Every quantum theory we actually have, I mean, there are people who don't like this, but okay, has the wave function or what I, I prefer to call the quantum state. So I'll just, uh, this is just a little terminological deal because the wave function is obviously a function. Okay, it's a mathematical object of some kind. It's, if it represents something physically real, and not every mathematical object does represent something physically real, that thing I call the quantum state. Bell's point is that the quantum state in no theory is a local beam. It's never a local beam. Quantum states do not have values at localized points. They just what don't. Psi of x? I, I, I'm con confused. My wave function is psi of x. X so is a every configuration space. I have some value for psi. This is X is a configuration space. No, 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 no. X, Y, Z, R, here. Here there is a wave function. If you've got more than one particle, it doesn't have that form. But it's not, I don't talk about the particle. I don't need microscopic particles. More than one variable. Things. I want something, objects. You talk about screen, magnets. So talk about the center of mass of a magnet. The center what, of mass the mass? magnet is uh, located or center of mass of my cup. The, Lev, where's the, the mass? Don't place. talk about the center of the mass until you give me the mass. No, no, Unless no. you give me a center, I don't want mass, mass in space center, time. Uh, it's Lev, let me finish. Lev, let yes. me finish. Yes. Unless you have a distributed mass in space time, you don't have a center of mass. So, so, so that we agree that we have particles in quantum mechanics, yes? No, so no, I can no, say it's about density of particles. No. Where is the center of density of particles of, of this cup? I take all these particles, some of all, uh, what they say, this mass, uh, uh, this uh, beable, the mass density, take out the mass of my particle, just trade the sum of uh, position uh, of a number, number operator, uh, and uh, the set, 
uh, take all the particles of this cup and take the number and take the, uh, and take the expectation value of a center. It lives in three-dimensional space, moving three-dimensional space. I, I can take it and, and put it. And there's nothing there. Out of this. What? There's nothing there, Lev. What do you mean nothing? The there? center of mass of your cup is no, empty it's, space. It's uh, just a way to represent it. I can represent it in any other way. I want to represent there's it. There's nothing it. there. But my Lev, cup is three-dimensional. Lev, focus, focus, focus. Yes. You said use the center of mass. It's There's a, nothing there. It's not a vehicle. There's nothing physically there. Or I a donut. Just, There's nothing know, there. It, it, has, it has dimensions. So clearly, the center of mass doesn't. Point to, to, uh, my cup has, it's not just a point, not material point. So to, uh, to the, I cannot, uh, but I want to describe where it is. This is what's important, where it is, so I can take it. Now it's, uh, you don't see it on the table. Now it's in my hand, now it's my other hand. So I have to describe where it is. This is what you need for your beables. So mm -hmm. I don't say it's center of mass, center of position, center of some geometrical thing. So I, I take the wave fun, I, I take, I take this particle, the particles, and of course it will not be, uh, you know, the center, it's empty. There is nothing. Yeah, that's the my center point. of mass, there is nothing. So I, but, uh, but it doesn't, uh, if I want to describe where is the, uh, in any kind of theory, where is the cup? Of course, there are all these difficulties. I say that the cup here, I have to think what will be, uh, will, how I describe the position of my cup. Is a, where is the center, the handle, which I take, or any other thing. This is difficult, uh, this is other difficulties, not related to anything like this. In the moment, um, if we believe that everything made out of single particles, like, maybe Laplace, Newton. So you'll say, okay, this is where these particles. Now we say, no, no, it's not the particles, the atoms and the kind of clouds of uh, wave functions. There's no difference. They, 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 the bomb, no. There is no clouds of various atom or cloud of bombian particles, which are good, bomb, good uh, beables for you. Yes. Or kind of this, this wave clouds of atoms. It's the same completely from for any practical purposes. Uh, it's exactly the same. There is no difference if you take the Bohmian position or you take the clouds of where the, uh, of where the atoms of this cup. No difference. There, there is so, a difference, Lev. Yeah. There's a, a very extreme theoretical difference, so everybody should understand that. Bohmian mechanics postulates as part of its foundational theory that there are indeed point particles. Yeah, yeah, I know, and I know. Your cup is made of them. I and know. It's definite positions. And I, everything you can say about the geometry of your cup is determined by that distribution of positions. Yes. But wave functions are not like that. I it's know, but, but I can take my wave function and do functionally exactly the same thing. Because the cloud of my atom, or oh, Bohmian position where it uh, sits, uh, various Bohmian particles it's of my atom, it's uh, essentially not distinguishable on any experiment. So there, there is no need. So I, 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 I well understand that the flashes of Bohmian, of Bohmian positions are beables, and the wave function is not beable in a bell sense. And what I say, it's you don't need beables because it's not un uh, unnecessary. The wave function, the, the cloud of the wave function is good enough. Uh, you don't need. It's, it's a necessary burden on the theory to add something new. Uh, you, you, take, you can take the wave function and use these clouds to describe your big, big systems. I, I, no, I, I, no need whatsoever for any variables. Rev, I'm going to try one more time. Yes. In all these theories, the wave function is a variable and it is not a local variable. Okay? And Bell's point is you need some local variables. You construct out of wave function, the cloud of the, where is the atom or whatever, the number operator, expectation value of position of, uh, of a particular particle, a special particle, this will make you this, your local beables. No, an expectation value is not a, a beable, okay? It's know. not. Uh, mathematically not, because conceptually be not. Because this is why the theory is much simpler, because you don't need that. I don't, I don't see any possibility of agreement soon, so <laughs> I think there is a, sorry, I think there is a couple of fingers there, though, so maybe they can help us finding. Uh, so, uh, Jan? Jan, you're there? 
Maybe your microphone is off. Okay. okay. I'm, on. I'm on now. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to, well, of course, I agree with Tim, but I, I wanted to ask if, you know, you can have, a, I think what, uh, you know, Lev is doing is try to have his cake and eat it, namely speak of a pure wave function ontology and then subrepticely introduce cups and things which are located in space time. While, of course, if you have a pure wave function, I don't even know what it means to be part of a wave function. I mean, you can, of course, use the wave function to construct things which are localized in space time by taking, I don't know, averages of operator, God knows what. But that doesn't mean, but that doesn't mean that you have a clear ontology in space time. Now, um, you know, Alori and others, Shelley, and who is there? Hi. Uh, have done actually a, a version of many worlds which does have actually an ontology. If I remember correctly, it's a continuous matter ontology. And in that theory, the theory is non-local as it should be. Uh, do, you need, do you see any way that the many, because I never understand these many worlds being local, except as you say, Tim, namely if there is no space time, then of course you can't even discuss locality. But do you think there is any way to have many worlds a version of many worlds that would be local and yet have an ontology beyond the wave function. That's my question for Tim. For Tim, for Tim. For me. For Look, Tim. I, 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 I'm just with Bell. I mean, the, the wave function mathematically is not a function on space time. It's no, no, but if you have an ontology on top of that, and, and, like, and for example, so, a continuous you know, matter ontology. Right, so if, you, if you have a continuous matter ontology, I mean, you could have. Is a flash ontology going to fix the thing? I don't know. Is a, I mean, look, if you're going to be a many worlds person, I'm not sure wh which way this is going, right? If you're going to be a many worlds person, often there people tried to do that because they thought they could really give a local theory. Yeah. Uh, I don't think anybody's ever done that. And we could talk about why they haven't done that. Now, Lev doesn't say that. Lev ad ad admits that many worlds is non-local, but he thinks it doesn't have action at a distance, which is yeah, I don't understand supposed that. to be a very specific kind of non-locality that he hates more than non-locality generally, right? Um, nobody, as far as I know, has been able to construct an actually local theory in, in a familiar space time, um, even, of many, even of a many world sort. Or uh, even uh, uh, many worlds which have no action at a distance. Uh, well, you know, no. A you know, the problem is, of course, action at a distance is not the, the the most precise phrase. I mean, you have to do some work to explain exactly what you mean by that. Um, um, yeah, but in the in the theory elaborated by Alori, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. She, she, I forget who Shelley in particular and others, then I think there is action at a distance just the same as there is in bone theory. Um, well, let me say something that, that I, I think Lev might agree with. This is, well, that would be nice. Um, which is that, I think in, that there is in, in, if we go to the setup that I had, okay, we have, and this is to bring on this parameter and outcome independence stuff, which is actually what we're supposed to be talking about. The, the orientation of the stern garlock matter magnet is the parameter, right? That's the thing that's under Alice and Bob and Charlie's direct control, and that they, they can arrange that however they like. And the outcome is where the spot forms, right? Which, which gives you the data that you call it was either up or down. And uh, there's a particular kind of especially egregious action at a distance, which occurs in a theory where you can say things like, according to the theory, in that experiment that was just run, where Alice oriented her magnet like this, if she had oriented it like that, the spot in Bob's lab would have formed in a different place. Okay, everybody got that. So it's a counterfactual claim depending on how this parameter was set, a distant outcome would have been different. Yeah. Right? And the theory actually endorses that. That's really straightforward action at a distance, right? Yeah. Now, in, in, in GRW, where you have these random collapses, you never have that because the outcomes, because it's a fundamentally stochastic theory, um, Alice can't, can't in any case 
as it were, steer Bob's outcome, how, you know, by moving her thing around because the collapses will occur at random. She, you know, the, and, and the actual outcome Bob gets will depend upon the result of that random collapse. So you get something that's not as in your face, right? It's a, it's a non-locality. It's, it's sure a non-locality, but it's not as in your face as the non-locality in say Bohm's theory or in any deterministic theory. Um, and that's the kind of thing that along many, many years ago, uh, Michael Redhead tried to make a distinction between action at a distance and passion at a distance. And the rhetoric was, oh, action at a distance is like really not relativistically acceptable, but passion at a distance kind of is. And you say, but wait, it's the at a distance part that's your problem, right? It's the at space-like separation, whether it's action or passion, right? That's what's really gonna, gonna run you into trouble with, with relativity. So yeah, you can make that theoretical distinction, but it doesn't really help you if, you're, if your job is to postulate a relativistic space-time and do your whole physics without adding to it, like adding a preferred foliation or something. Um, so I could, I could never, you know, people made that distinction. Uh, you know, so in GRW and, 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 and perfectly possibly in Webb's version of many worlds, if we could make sense of it in terms of what's going on locally, you might not have something you would call action at a distance because you don't have these definite counterfactuals if Alice had done this differently, Bob's outcome would have been different in that way, right? So we may just say whether I agree or not. Yeah. So it's uh, probably you don't mean signaling. It's not that the outcome. No, it's not. Signaling. So you mean that if Alice will do something different, then something ontological will be different in Bob's laboratory. Mm -hmm. This is what you mean but mm -hmm. not necessarily that they can use for signaling. Exactly, yes. So I didn't mention signaling. Now, and then what I claim uh, that in uh, Everett, whatever you do in Alice's things, you change nothing whatsoever in Bob's laboratory, nothing. However, in GRW, you do. If you have a, a particle and superposition in Alice and Bob, and you don't do anything for it, then the wave function most probably will remain half at the bob if you don't look on this particle. Now, if you come in Alice's laboratory and measure its presence with other particles, you will force the, the wave function, the collapse to zero or to one. So there is an action at a distance in GRW. And there is no action at a distance in, in many words. This is exactly action at a distance. If I have some ontology of my theory and I do something here, can I change something there? And in, in Everett, you do not. In GRW, you do. Yeah, so this is right. So this is the kind of thing that you will say, but you also admit that it's not a local theory, right? What? Well, what you what, admit that you're many worlds. Uh, local, oh. again, if somebody will say that separability, that theory might be uh, local and non separable, then I will say it's local. But I, for my, I think it's not separable between different places, so it's kind of non local. It's not separable because there is a connection between, uh, between Alice and Bob and this, in your GHZ story, when you make a measurement, every, every measurement will be two outcomes, one up and one down. And there is kind of connection between words with, uh, to Charlie and uh, uh, Alice to uh, how they connected. And right. nothing changed in Charlie because he will have a mixture, he will have both outcomes too. Okay, so, so this connection between the outcomes of in we, uh, of Charlie and uh, Alice and Bob through the world. In our world, it will be uh, because you know every time uh, the probability for every measurement in, G in GHZ experiment is half. So you create uh, both of them with equal weights. What I will say now, but they they have particular connection to to, to other one, 
And this connection is kind of non, it's not separable. You cannot say it's here, it's here. So in this, this is why you would say it's non-local. But whatever you measure here, you will not change any, anything there. Any ontology far away will not be changed. Okay, so, so let me try and tell, since we, we do need to cover it, let me try and tell a many world story with really good local vehicles. So you can actually talk about what's going on in a lab, right? Stuff like that. The, 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 the language I use to describe this experiment. And then you can correct me if I'm wrong, but let me at least tell the story as I understand it. So we, we start out with these three labs and there's Alice, A, Bob, B, Charlie, C. And for the sake of argument, let's assume the universe just began and, and unproblematically, there's one Alice, there's one Bob, there's one Charlie. And first of all, they have to decide, each one has to decide, am I gonna measure X or Z? So they, they, know about, they know about Lev's world splitter and they get out their things and they each use Lev's world splitter, right? So now we all know what's gonna happen. Now there are gonna be two Alice's, we can call her Alice X and Alice Z. There's gonna be two Bobs, Bob X and Bob Z. There's gonna be Charlie X and Charlie Z, okay? The, 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 that, that, that is, the theory is supposed to tell us that in this circumstance, in each lab, both experiments are done, right? And in Alice's lab, there are now two Alice's. Now they don't notice each other and they don't bump into each other and elbow each other because they're somehow out of phase or something. There are four, kind of there are four Alice's. Each other or something weird like that. Yeah, four, four of them, four of them. Four of them. Uh, well, not yet, right? Not yet. Now, I, I, all I've done so far is they each make the choice of which experiment they're going to do. Right. Okay. And then the particles come in and, you know, like amoebas, they double again. And so now we have four of them. We have Alice X up, Alice X down, Alice Z up, Alice Z down. And you get the idea. There's going to be a quadruple of Alice's, a quadruple of Bob's and a quadruple of Charlie's. Again, now four in each lab, and they still don't notice each other, right? Each is under the mistaken impression that they just did a single experiment, it got a single outcome. Now, they then decide to try and communicate with each other or talk to each other or go walk and you know, have a discussion. And the following weird thing happens. Alice X up, when she walks over to talk to Bob, she then now splits into four different successors who have seen, who talked to the, all the four Bobs, right? And so we, we, we now have 16 different Alices. Uh, so some of them will be No, not yet. All, zero. Be, all pairs of outcomes are possible. Yes, but some all of them will, will be coin will be together. No, no, because all pairs are possible. No, no, because, ah, ah, just for two, all possible, you're right. Sure. You look it's just talk for about. two. Just for two, yes, correct, you are right. Carlo, you wanted to say something? Uh, mute. You're mute. You're muted, Carlo. No, I think team, team knows that. I mean, uh, when you put all together, many of these possibilities are zero. But that's, right. I think Tim knows that. Right, then when, when, then when these 16 Alice's go to talk to Charlie and there are four Charlie's, some of the Alice's will not be able to communicate with some of the Charlie's, right? It's at that point where these constraints are gonna come in, right? I mean, it's a, Alice X up and cannot communicate with Bob X up and then communicate with Charlie X up. It's very simple, they will communicate to just one of them, it will be- I understand. Yes. Right, I, I understand that that's the story. I'm just saying, now the question arises, what determines that, okay? Was it a local kind of interaction that determined who gets to talk to who? And the straightforward answer in quantum mechanics is no, that was already fixed. It didn't depend, it's not like they had to go talk to each other for that structure, that branching structure to be fixed. The branching structure was already there. 
That is, there is no branch, immediately, there is no branch on which Alice measured X and got up, Bob measured X and got up, and Charlie measured X and got up. That branching structure is, de is, is determined by the structure of this non-local object that's the quantum state. And it it's was not say, it was created by measurements. You know, what? Measurements created branch structure. You, you, said, you said in the beginning it was one branch. You remember. And, right, and then there are more and more and more, no, but no, no, branches yes, don't so exist. Then each one decided what to measure. This, of course, there is no any correlation. It just makes decision. So there are two times two times two. So now it's two times two times two. There are eight branches. Mm -hmm. Now, but because particles were entangled, when they start make measurements, some of them were correlated. So some of them, it's not you just you just don't multiply it algebraically, uh, just normally. Some of them will be the same. Because automatically, and you know, when you make GHZ, the third one, it's already fixed. Right. So some of them, so the number of words, it, not be, it will not be eight. Uh, there were eight. So but then you will not multiply it by, uh, uh, by four possible outcomes here and whatever. It will be smaller. Right. And you can tell them to make some other measurement. If, if instead of measuring X and Z, some of them will make X, Z, and Y. So they can make more words. Because when they measure X, Z, the GHZ correlation fix uh, X and Z on, on uh, Charlie's side. But if Charlie will measure Y, Y can be everything. So the number of words will be bigger. Right. I, I'm just, I, I understand all that, Lev. I'm just making a point that at least at a certain moment of time, many people arguing for many worlds were under the mistaken impression that the decoherence, which is what's forming the branches, is limited by the speed of light. Because communication is limited by the speed of light. It isn't. The, the branching structure happens, as it were, instantaneously. And that's not very happy if you're dealing in a relativistic space-time. No, 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 no problem with space-time. No. The relativistic space-time, you have to worry about physics. You don't have to worry about words. Inside the word, the relativistic physics is wrong. You have bell inequalities. You have all kinds of, uh, you have eff effective collapses. The relativistic physics works for all words together. If you look on all words together, nothing happened in Charlie, whatever Alice and Bob do. If you look on all words together. And physics should worry about all words together, not about single word. In a single word, relativity breaks down. If, if what one means by relativity, which is what I mean, right. is that you can, you can determine the theory, you can state the theory, and the entire space-time structure is given by a Lorentzian metric. And yeah. that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is okay. This works. You can't no do it. Yeah, you can. Nope. Okay, you know, because because you've got entanglement. I mean, it, it's the entanglement is not a local kind of thing. Yes, yes, yes. This, here we agree. The entanglement connects these branches and it's not local. Word, the concept of word is not local. I have, uh, if there is an EPR, I measured up and my friend measured down. And I know that there is both, uh, there is another me down and uh, a friend in the same place, but he is up. So this connection is kind of non-local connection. Yeah, well, again, you, you, you're, you're happy to say it's non-local, which I'm very happy with. My, my Not point separable is, in another uh, way. That there, there was a thought that many worlds would be a local theory in Bell's sense. Uh, some people, uh, maybe, I don't know. Who, uh, Sorry to interrupt. Once more, maybe, so we don't have, we have one hour and so many questions. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but thank you for this discussion. Um, so uh, I don't know if uh, Carlos' point was related to that, uh, since it was about space time. And there is also- uh, Yes. Okay. It, it has to do with the discussion between Lev and Tim. So should I go? Yeah. Okay, so, um, I, in fact, I, I've enjoyed the discussion between between Tim and Lev because uh, uh, because I went through a similar discussion in my in my mind and with my my my, my collaborator in a slightly different uh, context, and we 
uh, we oscillated uh, exactly between the, the two positions. In fact, we, we published a sequence of papers claiming opposite things and uh, <laughs> um, contradictory things. So let's put it nicely. We corrected ourselves. Uh, um, uh, I, this is a, this is the context of, of, of relational interpretations. Namely, um, we started off by strong claims like, well, if you do a relational, uh, you, you, you solve the locality problem. Uh, I wouldn't write that, but we, 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 you, 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 you heal a lot of the pain of the non-locality um, uh, pointed up at this uh, EPR-like uh, uh, things. And there is a sense in which this is true, and I think this is what Lev is, uh, is insisting, because it's, a, it's, it's essentially the same sense in which it's true in, in, uh, in many worlds. Um, but there is also a sense in which this is false, and I think Tim is completely right. In fact, we changed our mind and we said, wait a minute, uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, the, the, the non-locality of quantum mechanics is irreducible, uh, in, independent of the interpretation that you, um, that, uh, that you take. Uh, and, 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 and we publish a paper uh, on, on that. Now, of course, the, the subtle point here is that locality, it's, um, it's not a precise expression in all these uh, in all these uh, uh, these debates, and uh, uh, it is true that locality depends on the interpretation. And I think the work of Bell makes it very clear, because uh, um, in the way Tim think thinks, which is strongly influenced by 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 uh, by Bell. Uh, the notion of locality is, is strongly attached to the notion of local uh, beables. And the notion of local beables depend on the interpretation that you, that you, um, th that you choose. In fact, it's, it's an interpretation dependent things. It, it depends on the ontology. Yeah. So locality changes slightly when you, uh, when you change interpretation. But it doesn't change because the physics change, of course. I mean, the prediction is the same. It changes because you assign a different, um, a different ontological weight to, 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 to different things. And at, at the end of the day, it, it is true, in my opinion, that uh, whether you go uh, many world or whether you go um, relational uh, or, 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 or GRW sort of same thing, it's a, you, you are giving up um, some aspect of uh, uh, what Bell would call uh, a local um, uh, uh, a local theory, uh, which uh, in that sense make the theory non-local. So I, I think that the most right in in in, uh, in in a sense. So let me uh, let me say this. I I, I heard Tim. Uh, uh, I listened to Tim very carefully. I think he he gave a very nice. Uh, uh, summary of of the of the entire story, but I would I would like to uh, to to emphasize two things. One is that at the beginning, he when he set his ideas, he talked about local observables, and then he said, "Well, let's assume that essentially there is no many world, there is no relational interpretation, there is nothing that uh, you have a single world with a single space time in which there are local beings." And then he commented that, uh, saying, but because doing any, anything else um, uh, uh, seems to me a desperate move, which I don't want to consider. Uh, it, it seems to me this is a common discussion in, in, in interpretation of quantum mechanics. Uh, we have a, a number of possibilities, they're all viable. Each one of them seems a desperate move, seen from those who like other possibilities. So everybody's right, and everybody's right to be um, uh, uh, disgusted and uh, and uh, and uh, offended by what uh, the interpretation he or she doesn't like uh, uh, assume. Uh, but that's not the point. The point is that whatever you do, uh, you get to some point uh, in which you make an assumption that's uh, it, it's very offensive to our. Uh, way of thinking, including uh, Tim's way of thinking. So uh, the argument, uh, well, if you do that, you, you, you make something implausible or 
I mean, Tim is right. If you do, if you go many walls or if you go relational, you're still doing something in some sense very non-local. No doubt about that. It seems obvious to me. Uh, so you're not solving the problem. Yes. Um, now, let me get to the last point and then I shut up, uh, which maybe is the main point I wanted to, uh, to get at. The, the second thing I noticed in, uh, uh, in Tim's um, presentation is at the end when he, um, he gave his you know, long speech, which you need local observables and you need, observ you need local beables, sorry, and uh, you need beables located in space time. And then he sort of um, uh, commented very negatively about Sean uh, uh, physics in Hilbert space. I don't like physics in Hilbert space uh, at all. I think that you don't do quantum mechanics with just Hilbert spaces. You need more. You need operators. You need, uh, you need more mathematical structure. And that's exactly why physics in Hilbert space alone, uh, I think it doesn't make sense. Um, but to go from there to say, we describe the world in terms of uh, 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 quantities which are always located in space-time and therefore the foundation of our uh, theory needs a space-time, a given space-time where there are located the, um, entities. Uh, I think it's a non sequitur, it's a complete non sequitur. I mean, we describe the world in terms of colors, but we don't need, we, we, we can easily get colors out of the theory within some context approximation in some very relational way, by the way, and so on. And, and there are many, many, many um, uh, cases like that. And I want to say that because I think this overemphasis about the space time localization. Uh, it should not be connected to the locality issue. There, there are different things. And I work in quantum gravity. I don't know how much Tim knows about the work in, in loop quantum gravity and the foundational work in loop quantum gravity, which has been extensive, um, very, uh, very, uh, very articulated with a lot of papers, books written, um, where uh, space-time uh, in the sense of a manifold where are located fields or particles or whatever that happens is not in the foundations. And nevertheless, there's a perfectly well-defined way of connecting uh, the, 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 the observables of the theory, uh, let me talk about not, 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 not the beables here, with our observations. I mean, we can have, uh, we have magnets, but they are no magnets in the fundamental theory. We use in our laboratories complex notions, which we know how to, you know, derive from fundamental theory step by step, and space and time may very well be one of those. In, in, in quantum gravity, uh, there's not just a Hilbert space, there's more, there's a set of observables, but this observable relate subsystem the way they talk to one another and not, up, uh, not require to have a localization in space and in time to start with. Because your space timing come it in a second in a second uh, in a second point. So I I think I will take with a lot of grains of sale this requirement that, that oh unless we have space and time we cannot do physics. Unless with usual space and time we cannot do physics to start with. Thanks. Yeah okay. yeah so let me let me just you know I I I said things that, that I think um, you interpreted too strongly and I understand why you did. So let me try and moderate them, but in a, in a very clear way. Um, the first point is the, the word emerge is used in lots of different ways. I mean, it's kind of a real mess. There are some very straightforward senses of emergence, which more or less are just coarse graining. Um, the way in which you might say, look, actual seawater is not a continuum, continuous medium, but at large scales, we understand why using the Navier-Stokes equation is pretty good. It doesn't work when the waves crash and stuff, but you know, for lots of things, it's really good because in a way, if you take the atomic molecular structure of water, but you coarse grain at a large scale, you get something that's kind of provably gonna be very close to treatable as a continuum. Um, that kind of emergence is really, I mean, you have to prove it, right? There's some proof that has to be done. But if that exists, I'm perfectly happy with the idea that at a foundational level, at a really foundational level, 
space and time is quite unlike the way we think of it, but that something close to what we think of as every day emerges in that sense, right? Uh, so I'm co absolutely open to that. I mean, I personally, I'm working on, as you know, on the idea that space and time is fundamentally discrete and not a continuum. But I, I of course, want, as it were, continuum-like behavior within epsilon to emerge because continuum equations work really well, right? And you, you need a good explanation for that. So for that, I'm, I'm with you 100%, right? And I don't think that our naive picture of space-time has to be built into the foundations of the theory. But it, it should show up, right? And it should show up in a natural way. Now, one place where I'm, um, we'll push back a little is, it, it, again, it's a point that Bell makes when, with this talk of observables. And, and what Bell says is, look, observables have to be built out of beables. Beables are just the ontology of the theory, right? Beables are just what the theory says is there independently of whether any of anybody's observing anything. And so appeal to observables without an explanation for how the observables relate to just the on straightforward ontology of the theory, that worries me. And there are cases where you can say, look, we know how to use the theory in the sense that I can define a function or something from this to this. And, and, and but just defining functions, it, it, is not, to my mind, in itself, even if that, as it were, works practically, doesn't necessarily give me what I'm looking for in a physical explanation. And, you know, this is a subtle point that we, you know, I, I think we both understand that there are real subtleties about how the mathematics relates to the physics that's being postulated and, you know, things like that. Um, and then the, I guess the last point is, of course, I don't, you know, and this was also Bell's, but Bell didn't, well, let me go back a step. Einstein really believed in local, 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 and he says it. I mean, there's a nice letter where he says, the progress of physics has, to, has been to become more and more local, both in the ontology, which was field theory, going down to fields, which are local, you know, locally defined, and even in the laws, because if you, if you write the laws as differential equations in space and time, then even the laws are local, right? You can just carve out a little patch of space time and ask, do these laws obtain here? And, and, that was, and Einstein just thought that was the direction physics was going. And then all of a sudden, um, you know, quantum mechanics shows up with this spooky action at a distance and it's going the wrong direction. Um, so the... Bell, of course, accepts non-local beables, right? He accepts quantum mechanics in a way he, he treats the wave function as something that you should take as representing something physically real and something non-local. So I certainly don't expect a purely local theory. But the other side of the coin, I mean, what Bell was arguing, and if you want to disagree with this, I'd be interested in knowing why. What he's arguing is that the empirical content of the theory supervenes just on the local beables. That is, you don't direct, if there are wave functions, you don't directly observe them. You only know they're there because you know something moved in a certain way, right? Just as in a way, electromagnetic waves are not directly observable. You only know they're there because they interact with charged matter and you know create currents and do other things. Um, and, and so it's that programmatic appeal to local beables to make the, the, point of, the point of connection between the theory and the observations. Um, and, and whether that occurs at the foundational level or at some emergent level, that's an interesting question, right? If you think that the space time can kind of emerge, maybe it's okay for that point of contact to, as it were, be at this emergent level. Um, and I think we'd have to just look at particular theories and how they work and to, to understand that, because I, I think it's a subtle question. Yeah, we don't disagree, I think, in, in a lot of that. Good. Thanks. Okay, uh, if uh, there are no more fingers, uh, I guess that was basically a new question. So I'm moving on to the questions. Uh, in order, I have uh, Aurelien, then I have uh, Giuliano from last week, then I have Alberto, Paul, and finally Mauro. 
So that's the order. Uh, unlikely that we're going to finish, but let's try. So first is Aurelien. Okay, so I think my microphone is okay. Hey, my microphone is on. So uh, my question is about um, the other possibility that uh, you didn't discuss too much to to go to, to resolve the the not the bell the bell um, the bell problem the the GHZ of the RD paradox. Uh, it's about um, you, you mentioned the non-locality problem as a, as a solution for 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 all these uh, issues, but uh, and I agree that non-locality is certainly the, the most interesting, uh, at least for me, uh, possibility because I'm, be, I'm advocating uh, the Breitbaum uh, theory, but uh, there are also, there are also uh, other possibilities that you mentioned briefly in your, in your talk, it's about, uh, uh, about superdeterminism and about um, also retrocausality. I think there's one paper in, in the book of uh, uh, of Bell, uh, which is a small reply, a kind of um, additional uh, chapter to the one that you sent uh, to us to read. It was, a, I think you, you sent a paper that was called The Theory of Local Behavior. And this paper uh, has, a, has another one, has another part which is, which is called Free Variable and Local Causality. Yes, right, Free Variables and Local, yeah. Right. And, and this paper is very interesting as well because it's discussing uh, some uh, hypothetical elements that. Okay, maybe he didn't enter too much into the details, but I, because probably he didn't like the idea. But uh, what do you think really about that? Because you wrote about uh, about this retrocausal stuff in your book you know, oh, yeah. some, some years ago, and now uh, did something change for you about this? Or it's, uh... Yeah. So so let me let me I, I can say a word about that. So Bell really the derivation has two assumptions. Hmm. One is a locality assumption, what he calls local causality, and and it actually. If you look, I mean, it, it changes how he puts it in different papers. The last paper was La Nouvelle Cuisine, which is not even in the early, early editions of Speakable and Unspeakable. But there is another assumption, and he's aware of it, and it's, it's the one that this other paper you just mentioned is about, which is the statistical independence assumption, right? And what that is, is the assumption that um, the way that Alice and Bob and Charlie's magnets are set, if we do this experiment over and over again, is in a statistical sense uncorrelated with the states of the particles as they arrive, right? So if we imagine, you know, a stream of these triples of particles coming, uh, one triple coming every 10 seconds. And so we have, a, we, we have an ensemble of triples that uh, the select, and each time, Alice, Charlie, and Bob make a decision. They, they, they create a global experiment that those global experiments are sampling randomly from the incoming triples, okay? That's the statistical independence. And that's what supposed you get by saying, well, they just flip coins or they, they do whatever. They use random number things. They, they do what you'd normally do in any experimental situation to make a random selection. Now, one thing that's obvious kind of programmatically is that if you deny that, you can kind of get anything you want. Um, and and the, the typical example we use is, you know, people want to know whether smoking causes cancer. And so they take a big collection of mice and they flip a coin and divide them into the experimental and the control groups. And they expose the experimental groups to smoke and they don't expose the control group. And then they notice how cancer comes up. And if there's a whole lot more cancer in the experimental group, they conclude that the smoke is causing cancer. Now, you know, as, as a logical point, one could say, no, 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 no. It's just, you know, some mice are predisposed to get cancer and some are not predisposed to get cancer. And you just happen to put all the cancer bound ones into that group. And then you say, yeah, but I just flipped coins. And they say, yeah, yeah, but no, no, they still got, but I'll do something else. So no matter what you do, right, I'll use the digits of pi. No matter what you do, all the ones that are going to get cancer go into that group. Now, I think, you know, you can't logically refute that, but I can't logically prove that you exist. I mean, you know, you know, philosophers are used to radical skeptical hypotheses. That level of skeptical hypothesis is so crazy that it undercuts all of experimental method, right? So it's not that I can logically refute it, but I can say, if you're gonna go that far, you know, just give up 
on experimental science. Um, that's different. That kind of pre-established harmony or conspiracy theory is different than retrocausation. So this is the other point I want to make. Is that, you know, the language here gets confused. Retrocausation is a different idea. It's the idea that Alice's choice in the future actually influences the state of the particles when they are created. So that's not a weird conspiracy, but it does require backward causation. And the idea of putting forward and backward causation together at the same time was something that Wheeler and Feynman kind of also gestured at. It's, it's very hard to even write down a theory yeah. that makes sense, that has both classical level, it is possible. Together, right? It's really hard. And I, as far as I know, nobody even knows if there are, you can, maybe even if you can write down some equations, nobody knows if there are any solutions. And to me, retro causation, look, I think time passes. I think time goes forward. This is a weird view I hold. <laughs> um, so I'm just not a fan of retro causation at all. Um, but at least you need to separate a blank denial of statistical independence from a retrocausal story, which is trying to give you a mechanism by which that happens. Yeah, but can I make a remark about retrocausation? It seems to me that if you have instantaneous action at a distance, then in some frame you will have retrocausation. Uh, right. I mean, the natural like way to put in, I would say the natural way to put in instantaneous action at a distance is to put in a preferred foliation. Okay. And say that, that's, that there is a real objective foliation to space time and nothing happens retro in it. Okay, but you agree that that's uh, adding more unobservable quantities? Yes, it's, it's adding more to space time. I mean, it's adding more space time structure than general relativity postulates. Absolutely. Uh, I agree with you, actually. But... So, all, 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 all possibilities um, are crazy in, a, in some sense. Either you, you go through, uh, through the backward light cone, or either you go through uh, the, uh, the external part of the light cone, and then you. Yeah. Right. But see, I, I personally, you see, I have this view. <laughs> so let me just get, again kind of go to a, a hundred thousand feet. Um, if you if you focus on what you can observe, which is what the the good part of logical empiricism, right? There was a lot of bad stuff that came out of logical positivism and logical empiricism, but the good part came from saying, look, let's always keep in mind what we can actually, as it were, observe and what we infer from what we can observe, right? And then we can try and be careful about what those inferences are. Space-time structure itself is not observable, right? I mean, Newton could observe that if he twisted up a bucket and let it spin, that the surface of the water did this. But that's not observing space-time structure. He, it, it, it was a phenomenon that he introduced a certain space-time structure to explain. Um, and until Bell came along, there was no phenomenon that you would need a preferred foliation to explain. I mean, that's what I think Einstein realized. That was the beginning of relativity, was realizing that I don't need absolute simultaneity. I certainly don't need it to do Maxwellian electrodynamics, right? So why postulate it? Well, let's go on. Let's see if we can do gravity theory without it. Well, it turns out you can, that's GR. But, but none of those involve violations of Bell's inequality. And so, you know, the violation of Bell's inequality ought to hit you like a thunderbolt. And to me to say, well, maybe there is a foliation after all. Why, why am I postulating it? Well, because I have this new phenomenon. And certainly if you, if you give me that to play with, it's easy to write down theories that make essential use of this foliation and that will give me the right predictions. You know, single world theories. And, and, and you see in these theories, and this is what you see in De Broglie Bohm theory. You, you can just look at the theories and you understand what's going on and how this is moving and what would have happened. And you know, you, you, you have a clear grasp of what's going on. To me, you know, most people think adding a preferred foliation is some horrible thing, but I can't figure out why, because it's, it, it's kind of a negative theology, right? You say, there, there shall be no such object, 
Um, well, gee, it would be really useful theoretically to have it. Why are you so opposed to it, right? If, if you're willing to imagine there are, you know, all these unobservable worlds and you're willing to imagine that there are all these, you know, compactified dimensions of space time, why is, you know, why is it just a bridge too far <laughs> to throw a foliation on and say, yeah, maybe that's there. Um, so I, I, I find that such a simple and straightforward approach that the other approaches strike me as Baroque, right, from kind of from the beginning. Okay, next one is Alberto, who sent me a question uh, by email. Yeah, I sent a question regarding the more the talk that John made last time. It was more a technical question. I think I'm gonna try to take it off uh, offline. I will take the opportunity of my slot though for to make a couple of comments. <laughs> and uh, is uh, I just uh, encourage to think about uh, if you look at the GHZ uh, experimental tests, there are two, uh, I would not call them non-local, but let me call them global features uh, of the experiments. And one is that uh, uh, all uh, all the signal come from the same initial beam. Now you have beam splitters and systems to distribute. But then uh, the, so the analysis of the source uh, is a uh, is a feature that brings global, global uh, aspects to the experiment. And the second one is the fact that each uh, uh, detector is co-calibrated with the others. Uh, Einstein teaches us that to talk about uh, synchronicity, you need to, to calibrate the time. When you do these experiments, you have to calibrate the alignment. So even if you do measurements very, very far away from each other, before you do them, uh, you have to calibrate each uh, experimental setting with respect to the others. So I would say rather than space-time is time-space. <laughs> what in relativity you have to do with time in these experiments, you have to do with space. And, and this brings the global teachers to the experiment. So it would be interesting to have your thought later. But right. I, mean, I, I just should say you're, you're, of course, technically absolutely correct about, uh, uh, about that. The calibration really wouldn't require anything non-local in the normal sense. That is, uh, say at the source, I just start sending out a, a pure beam spin up in some direction that I call the X direction. And then Alice, you know, adjusts her stern gerlach apparatus until she gets 100% up outcomes. And that's how she aligns what she calls X with what I call X. And the same for Z, right? And, and I can do this individually with each of the three, right? I, could, I can do that individually with each of the three experimenters. That doesn't require any entanglement or... No, 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 but it's a global feature of the experiment. That's yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and it's to preserve the, through the experiment. Yes, yes, it is. Yes, right. Yeah, so if we were to do it in a zero gravity environment, it would be very difficult to do this experiment. <laughs> um, well, uh, if you did the calibration the way I just said, it, it, you wouldn't have a problem in zero gravity. Uh, alignment is, anyways. Well, anyway, I, I I'm not experimentalist in my, in my fantasy, you know, world of not talking about non-locality. I think there are two very clear uh, global features in this. Mm -hmm. So the question and, and is whether guess, there's any relationship, uh, even if they're not strictly related. Right. Um, I, I mean, there's one other thing to say just, just for the point. It's true that we, we talk about doing the experiment having a source that sends out this entangled triple because the way we typically create known types of entanglement is by having a common source. Uh, but the existence of entanglement between distant systems is absolutely generic, right? I mean, in, the, in a vacuum state, everything's entangled with everything else. I mean, a vacuum state will violate Bell's inequalities. Um, the, the, the exception is product states. Right, the, the kind of tiny little exceptional part of Hilbert space for a system, for a many particle system, 
are the, are the product states and the generic states are entangled and every entangled state will violate some, some Bell inequality. So um, the fact that you use a common source is, is just epistemic it, because it lets you know what entangled state it is. It's not really because that's essential for there being entanglement. Thank you. Uh, next one I have is Paul, who also sent me a question. Whenever you want. Uh, I have to ask you to uh, mm -hmm. unmute. Yeah. Okay, now. now. Uh, um, yeah, so, um, well, first of all, I'd just like to say that um, I completely take Tim's point about many worlds needing local beables, and I don't think they're there, and that's something that I'm going to talk about next week. But apart from that, it's, it seems, from the, point, from the point of view of the point that Bell's making, it seems there are two distinct senses of locality. There's this concern about having local beables, and there's also this concern about the EPR correlations and so on. And the story with many worlds and the EPR correlation seems to me really gets sort of quite complicated because when you start to introduce um, people, uh, you know, using um, a random number generator, then from many worlds point of view, then there are actually going to be zillions of different splittings and this sort of thing. So, um, so I sort of pa pass on that, but I do I take the point about uh, needing local beables, and I think that you know I was re I was really glad to be directed to the um, that Schrödinger paper and to those um, those chapters from the from Bell's book because I think that really helped. Yeah. So that's it. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, well, I, mean, so I, don't, I don't know, I mean, I don't, so I don't have a specific, but the question, I suppose the question, would you agree, Tim, that there are, that there are two distinct senses of, of locality, which Bell is concerned with, there's this concept, the, the local be able and the, yes. um, the EPR business. Yes, yeah. yes, absolutely, and in fact, I, I mean, they, they are independent, you could imagine uh, and I, I talked about this in my first book, you could imagine a theory which only has local beables. So it doesn't have a, it doesn't have a quantum state or a wave function, which s s just isn't a local kind of thing. And that violates Bell's inequality just by having kind of classical tachyons, right? That there, there's kind of straightforward communication between space-like separated labs via local particles that travel along space-like curves, right? So that could be a theory of, com of only local beables, right? Um, that would have non-locality in Bell's sense because, because straightforwardly the, the causal structure would not be local in the sense of every, all the causal relations being between things that are time-like separated. Right, so I mean, for for a, for a many world theory to work, it's got to incorporate both local and non-local uh, beables. Yeah, I mean, you know, the many worlds, a lot of the many worlds rhetoric is this Occam's razor kind of rhetoric saying, look, our whole ontology is just the wave function or the quantum state. Um, and that's a reason, you know, that's in our favor because simpler is better or something like that. Um, of course, because the quantum state's not itself a local thing, then you're immediately in trouble because you just, now we've gone the other direction. Instead of a theory with only local vehicles, you seem to only have non-local vehicles and then you don't quite understand how to interpret it. Uh, okay. But I, I, I think that's, you know, I, what, what Bell, again, this is why Bell's in, in, when, in against measurement, when he, he articulates his vision of, of Bohr, of Copenhagen, and he says, look, Bohr has a dual ontology. He has psi, or he says maybe many psi's, it's not quite clear, is there only one universal one? And he has these capital X things, which are the classical variables, which involve, you know, uh, how you would uh, describe the experimental situation. And 
you know, Bell's point there is to say he thinks that's right. You need this vocal part. But the problem with Bohr is that in, in Copenhagen, it's as it were confined to macroscopic scale. And Bell says, wait, no, that doesn't make any sense because macroscopic microscopic is a vague distinction, right? So what you want to do is have these local beables defined at all scales. The, the natural thing is you have some microscopic local beables and then the macroscopics are just the collections of the microscopics. And then you understand what you're doing, right? Then it's just perfectly clear what, 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 what you're doing. Uh, and yeah, I mean, we agree. Uh, and, 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 you know, even, even some of the many worlds people have come to see that not having an explicit account of what their local beables are puts them in an odd situation <laughs> when, you know, when you ask to say, well, explain to me how you understand this experimental setup, right? Um, and, and, and it is a weird thing. And this is something, again, the, the talk of observables is just a terminology that buries a real deep conceptual problem. Because someone says, oh, well, you know, what did I observe? I observed the, the Z spin. Well, what's that? Well, the observable is this and this Hermitian operator, right? As if you can just write down a Hermitian operator and throw it in an experimentalist and say, here, measure this, right? And they're gonna, you know, I mean, I can take, I can take position and momentum and add them up and get a Hermitian operator, but you know ask an experimentalist to go measure that, they're gonna look at me like I'm crazy. Um, so th this, this I, there's a very nice paper in the, in the De Broglie Bohm research tradition about the emergence of the operator formalism. If you take the De Broglie Bohm theory seriously, the Hermitian operators don't play any foundational role at all. But you can also analyze the theory and see why they turn out to be the right things to give you certain statistical predictions under certain circumstances. And you know, that's the kind of work that I find really enlightening, right? Where you say, oh, now I see, given what you're telling me the physical world is and how it works, why this piece of mathematics is showing up as a useful piece of mathematics. Um, and, 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 and I feel like I understand what's going on rather than someone just saying, look, here's a piece of mathematics, use it this way and make predictions. That's just instrumentalism and it doesn't help me at all. Right, okay. So, I mean, I take your point. Um, many worlds need local beables and, and I, I agree with you, it doesn't have them. And um, I've been getting a lot of enjoyment of, out of trying to find them. <laughs> Whether I've discovered them is another thing. <laughs> Uh, nice cut, by the way. Uh, next one is in, in the list is... Which uh, happens to be alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. in, this, in this branch, it's alive, it's alive exactly. <laughs> uh, so next one uh, is Giuliano, who also sent me a question. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so thanks. Um, so that, that was about uh, uh, last week's talk and, and is a slightly uh, uh, different uh, focus. But so uh, th there was this claim that, that was, was quite central to the, to, the, uh, to the talk and that I think also uh, Tim says something about it, uh, um, that uh, uh, you need uh, uh, quantum mechanics to derive non-locality. Uh, and uh, so, so I was wondering what exactly um, is meant with by it because it seems to me that like there are two readings. Um, one, I think that uh, seems obviously true, but also maybe not so interesting. And the second reading is more interesting, but then it's not so obvious that it's true. So I mean, if it just means that you don't need the conceptual tools uh, uh, that you find in, in, in what we usually call quantum theory in order to derive uh, non-locality, that's I think that has been shown uh, well, for instance, by last week's talk, and, and there were some, some other examples made. Uh, um, but um, there is a stronger reading, which is like uh, that you don't need to appeal to reality as it is described by the theory that we usually call quantum theory. And, uh, and in the second uh, sense, uh, uh, um, so I, I, I haven't seen, at least I haven't, get, uh, I haven't gotten the, the where the argument for that was, because I mean, even if it's uh, so, for instance, the the 
appeal to uh, um, non-contextual maps and the fact that there are like no goterium from that or there are you know, demonstrations that they, they, you cannot build those maps. Uh, but I mean, as far as I understand, I mean, that's, it seems to be uh, uh, essentially linked to the fact that uh, we are talking about uh, uh, properties that are properties that are usually, uh, I mean, that are on, on, in the quantum sphere. So uh, for instance, a non-contextual maps for properties like temperature or, or other microscopic copper property uh, would be possible, right, or not? I mean, that, that's, okay, that's my question. Um, I don't understand the question. So maybe Tim wants to answer. Yeah, let, let me try. Let me try because um, I think I understand some of the questions, and maybe I can make a connection to what John did that'll make this clear. Um, look, the sense in which you don't need quantum mechanics to get to non-locality is just you know, just take this experiment, this Alice Bob Charlie experiment. Uh, and suppose people just stumbled on it. I mean, you know, they, they didn't use quantum mechanics. They were just tinkering around in the lab and they had some magnets and, and they, they, you know, they notice when they do this, they get these results, okay? Um, that gets you into trouble. <laughs> that gets you into locality trouble. Um, and the connection to that, to the non-contextual maps is actually exactly what I had when I asked you to fill in these circles, right? with either a U or a D, like we had here, I don't know, um, uh, uh, Bob, Bob X. This is a non-contextual map, right? It's saying, if Bob measures X, this will be the outcome, and that outcome does not depend upon what Alice or Charlie happen to measure. Okay. And the non-existence of a non-contextual map, which is what Jean was talking about, is, this is just an example of it. Okay. And again, you can you can go through all this and not mention not quantum mean. mechanics. You just say, "Gee, here are some results, which in this kind of experimental situation, if you got these results, a local theory is not going to give you those results." Okay, but you, you don't need to grasp the, the theory to to get uh, the result. Fine, but right. you need you need the, the I mean you need to look at the part of reality that the theory is about, right? If you if you do an experiment only with respect to I don't know, temperature or of, of, of right. that, would, that wouldn't work, right? Right, I, I, look, maybe there's one other historical comment. You know, Einstein, it, again, in one of his letters, has this, it's in actually the same letter I mentioned before, I think it's to Born. You know, he has this very short thing that aspires to be an argument, but isn't quite, <laughs> um, which goes, Look, if, 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 if the world were not local in the sense that I've just said, which is that what's going on in one region is independent of what goes on in a spatially separated region. He said something like that, then you just couldn't do physics. And I and think the thought was, if in order to make a prediction for this lab, I had to take into account everything everywhere, then as a practical matter, I, I'm never going to be able in a position to do it. Right? There might be a physics, but I could never discover it. That's not an argument because quantum mechanics is a counterexample to it, right? I mean, you can make perfectly good statistical local predictions in quantum mechanics, even though it's wildly non-local. I mean, take de broglie brown if you want to question that. It's clearly a non-local theory. Clearly, you can make local predictions and test them. So you know, the, the, that little gesture at an argument of Einstein's doesn't really go through. And you, you know, you have the actual constructed counterexamples that show um, that it does. Okay, thanks. There is a finger from Carlo. Super briefly, um, on, exactly on this, on this point that Tim, you just made. Uh, Einstein is, it's wrong, it, but, but the way it's wrong is extraordinarily subtle and telling. Uh, because uh, this non-locality uh, permits, nevertheless, us to do local physics, because uh, it, it's true that what happens here, in the appropriate sense, depends on what happened there. But there's no way what that whatsoever to realize that yeah, if yeah. we just stay here. We yeah. only we also need to information about what happened there. Right. 
so it's there is an extraordinary locality that survives in spite of this non-locality. Absolutely. I mean, look, local physics works really, 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 really well. Now, I think, you know, the other piece to this, at least in the kind of de broglie bohm way of thinking about it, is this idea of quantum equilibrium, where the ultimate explanation for why you can get local stuff that works so well, really kind of runs through the law of large numbers and through you know, the same thing we get in thermodynamics, that there are certain things that happen at equilibrium that become very simple to describe. Um, and out of equilibrium, they wouldn't be, right? Um, so at, at least at a high level, there's a kind of interesting way in which, in which you know, statistical considerations and kind of thermodynamic considerations come in in, in in explaining this remarkable thing that, that, that you know, I mean, everybody would have expected, you, you would almost expect that evolution, right? Why didn't evolution find non-locality, right? Because why can't, you know, why can't some amoeba do better in the world by exploiting non-local stuff, right? And then you have the Nobel telephone theorems and all this stuff, you know, to say why you can't use it for signaling. Uh, it's a it's it's an interesting story and not not one you'd expect right i mean my expectations would have been with einstein without the details filled in i'd say gee if you try and do that there's going to be a mess right it mm -hmm. just turns out for very interesting subtle reasons there isn't yeah yes just a very very short last thing on this so maybe yes. this connect with the so at a certain point last week uh, was asked well it's it's weird that that physicists, uh, you know, uh, seems not to digest non-locality when they are very easily, you know, they can digest non-reality. You know, right? yeah. Well, maybe maybe historically or sociologically, I don't know, is because non-locality is connected with this fear of uh, trashing all the experimental side of physics. I mean, it's irrational because it's not there, but maybe historically non-locality always has been connected with this with uh, thought, and that's why has been seen as worse than no reality. I don't know. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, I just want to make one short remark. I don't really agree that quantum mechanics says anything about the world. Strictly speaking, quantum mechanics is only an algorithm to predict results of measurement. If you think it describes the world, then you have to tell me what the variables are, the local variables, etc. The boy boom theory describes the world, but the ordinary quantum mechanics does not. It just tells you what the results of what the statistics of results of experiments will be. I mean, strictly speaking, of course, physicists have all kinds of images about what's going on, and you send a particle here and there, and uh, you know. But but these are images, and they are not strictly speaking allowed by the theory. Of course, that would be for two hours discussion if I go into that. So. I keep it in mind. Uh, so the last question was from Mauro, but Mauro is having problem uh, with this connection, so it's not there, unless it's there under another name, in which case, please pen now. Okay, so I guess we can uh, finish a bit earlier today, uh, unless, of course, if there are other questions, let me know. Good. Uh, so yes, so I, was, I want to thank you a lot, Mo, uh, Tim, uh, and uh, everyone who participated to the debate uh, today. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Carlo. He's leaving now. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, and yeah, I'll keep you posted about next week. You already know that Paul is going to give a talk. Uh, so everyone, of course, is welcome. I don't know whether uh, that's a um, pragmatic do we do it at 4 p.m. or 2 Yes, exactly. That was exactly the question I was about to ask. So uh, I think, uh, Paul, we already told David and uh, Simon that it's at 2. But yeah. I guess we can send them an email. And uh, I don't know. It's, I think it depends if uh, people from the US uh, want to join. So I think there's time to, to, to decide that. I prefer at 4 also. But for different ah, you prefer at 4 anyway. So yeah, it doesn't matter to me. I mean, don't worry about me, but because it's just personal. But. Uh, I think I'm, I'm going to be traveling. You know, I mean, you originally moved it for my sake. I'm actually going to be traveling. I, I might be able to drop in, but, I'm, but it's not, not clear. So don't, 
don't do it for my sake. Okay, th thank you. No, it, it, it was mainly for you and also I think also other people are in the US. Uh, so I think I'm going to ask them. Uh, so now I have a reply from you. I'm going to ask, I don't know if Carlo is still in Canada, but uh, so Carlo might be another one. And also um, Jeremy and uh, Valia. Valia is there somewhere. Ciao Valia, welcome. Uh, so yes, uh, I'll, keep you, I'll keep you posted about that. Of course, it, it's up to the speaker. So Paul, uh, you will- I'm, I'm, e I'm easy either way. That's fine with me, yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, then uh, I'll send you a link with the recording. Uh, thank you a lot, Tim, for last time. And sure. have a nice week. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.